Good morning, and today I am joined with top literary agent Mark Gottlieb. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me here. I'm really glad you're willing to do this so early in the morning, but it's good. <laughs> it's good. Early bird catches the worm, right? Well, yeah, it's funny. I so I, I have an accounting job. That's what I do during the day. And so it's like, all right, I need to do my videos either late at night or early morning. Like, <laughs> Well, you know, some people are most creative, like either yeah. early in the morning or or sometimes, you know, as night owls when there's very little to disturb them, you know? Yeah, no, I've um writing for some reason works at like five o'clock or so. It's like, ah, brain's awake, it's fresh. <laughs> so we are living in kind of a really strange time with uh, the inflation right now. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, I saw that Biden did sign something to kind of try and help bring inflation down. But uh, yes, we're all living with it. Uh, the, the exaggerated prices of everything. Uh, its effects on the economy. I think you and I spoke about this a little bit before this show that, um, you know, it's had an impact on book publishing as well in that um, it's changing the ways in which publishers buy books. They're definitely a lot more conservative about how they buy books now. Uh, you know, they are trying to make land grabs in other areas where they can, you know, if they can pay less for something or get better things for themselves and contracts. They're they're trying everything they can. So they're really kind of focusing more on the price point where before they might, you know, kind of be a little risky with an idea. Now they're like, okay, we need to make sure this is going to really turn a profit for us. Well, definitely. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's going to change how many books publishers are buying from authors and agents to begin with. It's, it's definitely raised the prices of books. I've seen the price of books go up. They are probably going after certain things in publishing agreements that they normally wouldn't wouldn't do, but they're they're trying to get. So we have to, you know, kind of protect authors from that, uh, the rights of authors, the things they typically get, to make you know basically publishing contracts more economically sound for authors. You know, those are some of the things going on. And in the world of fiction, which, you know, normally you you will always want to sell a manuscript on a full if you can. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you can sell it on a partial. Now publishers are just insistent that it be a full manuscript because they're being very, very careful. Are they wanting to get it out the door like as fast as possible then? Like that kind of like we want a full manuscript. We want a quick actually into print turnaround time well i don't know so much about the rush i think they would if they could they would want to keep to their usual schedule of you know most uh books published 12 to 18 months either from the date of a signed contract or delivery of the manuscript uh but what's also gone on in the midst of all this and it's been going on for a while is uh you know it's all compounded by supply chain issues so a yeah. publisher might plan, okay, your book is going to publish on this such such and such Tuesday, but it really ends up being, um, it could end up being an, uh, you know, a, a different day altogether. So a lot of books are getting kind of re-diverted in, uh, you know, factories, things like that, different oh, printing presses. They have to use multiple printing presses in some cases just to get a, a wow. book. Wow. Yeah. So they're kind of outsourcing the actual printing and construction of the book then? Well, I mean, publishers, anytime you've ever seen certainly a book with very high design elements, like if you, any of the books behind you, if you had like an art book there or something like that, mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, color and illustration, chances are it was printed overseas, maybe in China or something like that. Oh, wow. uh, it's a lot cheaper. There are printing presses in sense. America still. Uh, there were some closures of those presses, um, but now what's gone on is, whereas in the past, a publisher could maybe print one book at one printing press, because they're so inundated, the, these plants, they kind of have to spread the printing sometimes across multiple plants. That probably adds quite a few more hands and just taking longer, doesn't it? It does. And then what it also does, it, it delays other publications. So a good yeah. example is when the Amanda Gorman book came out, you know, there was a very, very high demand for it. Mm -hmm. And 
Penguin Random House, I think they had to print across multiple plants. And then a lot of other books, you know, smaller titles that weren't necessarily a lead title like that. Like maybe if you were a key title or, or even a make title at a publishing house, you kind of got pushed aside a little bit to make way for stuff like that. Because they know that's going to be their highest income genera generator, probably. Like, okay, we need to make sure this gets in the print. That way we can get this out, get a revenue, then have some of the smaller books come out as well. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like other books had to kind of make way for these big, big lead titles at publishing houses that, you know, would, would suck up all the oxygen during, um, you know, all the supply chain issues, which are still really ongoing. It's not fully resolved. It's gotten better, but I wouldn't say it's fully resolved. Oh, yeah, definitely not. It's still constantly, at least where I'm at, we're always talking about the, the, the supply chain. Like we'll commonly go to the grocery store and, and there will just be shelves missing food. And if you go to any like, you know, technical store with like cameras and stuff, they're just missing tons of stuff these days. Yeah, people have to get used to that. And then on top of it, paying a premium for anything. Yeah. So you're going to pay a premium and then you're going to have to in many cases, wait a long time. You know? <laughs> the, um, I ironically throw the camera I'm using right now. Um, Sony discontinued it for a while for like last year and a half of a uh, computer chip shortage. Mm. And I ended up importing it from like Canada or somewhere. So I had to wait forever. I paid a bit more, but I, I got it. But it's it, it just to make like this one of their best selling cameras, like a really popular one, but it's like, sorry guys, we just, literally can't build the thing anymore it's definitely strange times i mean what happened early on in the pandemic what was very interesting what you had was you know everyone was suddenly stuck at home they're working mm -hmm. from home and uh, there was a big uptick in um notably paperback sales of the classics everyone suddenly reasoned with themselves i have time to read moby dick i have time to read War and Peace. And so they were buying these massive tomes, these classic works of literature. And then what happened was bookstores were closed, right? And you could, couldn't really go in bookstores or, or pick up orders. And then Amazon on top of it was uh, prioritizing other certain goods. Like, oh yeah. Uh, food, medicine, water, things like yeah. that. So it took forever for people to get their books and so they turned to audiobooks they turned to ebooks and so there's then a big uptick in sales in that space and now it's kind of leveled off a bit where a lot of bookstores have reopened publishers are operating at a little higher capacity than they were before but uh it was definitely uh very very strange times i mean um just to be living through it and seeing I think a lot of people came about in publishing. I forget who was the originator of this. It might've been James Patterson who had said that, you know, books are essential and they really are. But a lot of people also realize food, medicine, water might be a little bit more essential. Like <laughs> you know, when people's lives bit. are on the line. <laughs> right. So, but now you can, you can get a book, you know, a little bit more easily, I'd say than it, than you could in 2020 and around there. I actually ended up going, I, I'm just remembering during kind of the beginning, middle of the pandemic, I went on the audio book kick as well. Uh, yeah, no, I, well, because like I have woods around my house, you know, taking my dog for a walk was like the only thing I did to stay sane at the very beginning of it. So I just, you know, pop an audio book, go for a walk. And I was churning through like a book or two a week for a while there and... It's great. I mean, because you can you can kind of read on the go and, yeah. you know, to bring a book t with you to the gym or while you're driving. And, you know, for everything people say about audiobooks, some people are like, no, you, you have to really read a book like, you know, printed book. Yeah, that is a good experience. But also, I think storytelling also began kind mm -hmm. of in the oral tradition. So, you know, it's a it's still a legitimate way to read books, I think. I found that, like, especially for nonfiction, like, I couldn't tell the difference between, like, listening to it and reading it. Like, I mean, I, I guess I'll, maybe if you're, like, reading The Hobbit or, you know, Lord of the Rings, you might, you know, get a little more out of actually reading it. But it seems like for so many books, you can just listen to it. And it's pretty close. 
Yeah. And a lot of these narrators are very, very talented. A lot of them are, you know, professional actors, you know, they mm -hmm. can do different accents and voices and things like that. So it's, it's really terrific, but yeah, I mean, it was good to see, you know, a rise in audio sales that eBooks and audio could help sustain the industry. And then, you know, the other thing we're kind of, you and I talked about this a little bit before the show too, but the other thing we're kind of living through now is this merger that's going on between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster, which has been very interesting to see how it's sort of playing out in the courtroom drama, you know? I wouldn't say it's as juicy as like the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case, but <laughs> it's definitely been like significant. Well, second. <laughs> yeah, it may be okay. Um, I mean, that's that's a pretty significant thing for the industry, though, if you think about it. It's really not good for authors at all. Well, they're um, making a monopoly, essentially, aren't they? Well, they are. And frankly, Penguin Random House already has something of a monopoly over the industry. You know, they're already the 800 pound gorilla in the room, yeah, they're... certainly in the world of print. I mean, the way that Amazon is with regard to retail and, and ebooks, Penguin Random House is to the world of print. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that really surprised me, though, was when Penguin and Random House merged to begin with, DOJ didn't really even bat an eyelash. They, Interesting. you know, it just went, went right through and, you know, Penguin Random House, their whole reasoning behind this was, we'll become a mega publisher. It will be, finally, we'll be on equal footing with Amazon. We can, we can contend with Amazon and all it really amounted to in the end was they consolidated everything. You know, yeah. A lot of people were let go. Departments were closed because, you know, they're thinking to themselves, why do we need two or three of the same mm -hmm. department? or same personnel, they cut down on their space of their real estate. And then they kept all the, the business underneath them, like all of the authors and books, the backlist of titles they had. And so it really wasn't about anything other than the people at the very, very top of the company, you know, the shareholders, the owners, the, the chairman and CEO types, and then everyone underneath them kind of suffered as a result, the people working within those companies, who were quietly let go, the authors who then suddenly, there's one less publisher to sell your book to yeah. all of a sudden. And now for them to scoop up Simon and Schuster, you know, what that would mean is, well, we will go from big five publishers down to four. It's not, it's not a good thing for authors and agents, and it's not good for the people who work inside of those companies. No, it seems like that, like being an agent trying to actually, you know, sell a book to people. I mean, having one left publisher, that's, you know, 20% less opportunity to sell manuscripts. And they would have such, they could be so much more selective being like the only one, the only big one and the biggest now. Yeah. And so now the, the DOJ, they see all this and they stepped in and they decided to do something which really surprised a lot of people in publishing. I mean, the, the Authors Guild and other people were really appealing to the DOJ to, to like hear their cries for help. And yeah. <laughs> No one thought the DOJ would do anything because it's not like book publishing is like a big oil company or mm -hmm. there's like a merger between a, you know, massive telecom company or something like that. You know, book publishing is kind of small, almost like a cottage industry compared to like a giant car company or something. Yeah. Like that. And then the, the thing that was even more surprising is it's very hard to, you know, step into the ring with the DOJ, you know, the the courts are already kind of the judges are going to have some kind of leanings toward the doj you know the cards get stacked against you you would yeah. think that penguin random house and simon and schuster would just drop it you know when the doj mm -hmm. says you know it's an antitrust issue but no instead they've decided to go and fight it they're doubling down on it yeah so i mean i i, I don't know if they it's hard to say. I mean, you won't know the outcome until there's an outcome, right? It's not, it's just not a good look for them and it's not good for the industry. And frankly, I, I hope the DOJ wins just because I see things from the perspective of authors. So it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to, to see how it plays out. I was just thinking like, you know, just on the books behind me, like I'd say almost all of them are either Simon Schuster or Random House. Right, like whenever you look at especially yeah. top fantasy, because Tor is part of Random House, right? 
Uh, Tor, Tor is part of um, McMillan, but McMillan. Random House, they have Del Rey, and yeah. I think um, Simon and Schuster has a science fiction and fantasy imprint called Saga. That's okay. That's what I was thinking of. And yeah, um, Saga. So yeah, what what do you think will happen in that instance? Now, Penguin Random House already has Del Rey, and they have some other imprints that do a little bit of science fiction and fantasy. Now, you think to yourself, you're the you're the chairman or you're the CEO of Penguin Random House. You've just acquired Simon and Schuster. Suddenly you have two science fiction and fantasy imprints. You have Saga and you have Del Rey. And you think to yourself, why do I need two of these? Yeah. You know, I have and then on top of it, I have all this personnel. Mm -hmm. um, I can just keep the authors, I can keep all the books and you know, cut down on the company's overhead. So, you know, that's what'll happen to the people who work there. And then for the authors, it's going to be one less place. I mean, Marcus Dole, who, you know, he's the CEO, chairman CEO at uh, Penguin Random House. He's claiming that the publisher will still be competitive with itself, that they'll allow imprints to bid against each other up to a certain point. But, you know, just because they say that now doesn't mean it couldn't change in the future. No right? reason they have to do that. It's not like they're going to be legally obligated to. Yeah, do that. it's like we could change whenever we want to. Yeah. And then I think the reason why the DOJ is taking particular interest in this now is because of it all goes back to what we initially talked about in terms of the state of the economy, that it's causing inflation, that it had caused job loss and things like that. And by keeping Penguin Random House and Simon and Schuster separate, you'll protect a lot of jobs. You'll protect, you know, thousands of jobs. and and everyone who, that whole ecosystem that benefits from, you know, Simon and & Schuster and Penguin Random House being separate. It's kind of like, you know, you go to a baseball game and you see baseball players on the field. Most people, they just see the baseball players on the field, but they're not thinking of all the people who work in the stadium, yeah. all the people who, you know, make the merchandise, who sell the food, who sell the tickets and everything, who clean the place or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a whole economy that like runs along with that. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, you want more competition between publishing houses. Like you want them competing for a manuscript. You want bidding more money and you know publishing houses are co competing that's a great environment for the authors and it gives them more you know control over the situation but by cutting that down and kind of monopolize you're taking that away and kind of putting the power more in the publishing house especially with these two you know just percentage of the market i imagine they own quite a lot of it yeah yeah they need to regulate the market keep it as a fair marketplace mm -hmm. you know otherwise you end up with kind of end up with robber barons again and you end yeah. up with, you know people who if everyone if one person owns all the railroads in america you know you monopolize it uh charge whatever you want for a ticket it's you know not good for everyone else but at the same time there are you know disruptors let's say in the industry who you know will come about and begin to hopefully help things level off a bit. You know, there are larger independent publishers. Mm -hmm. There are places like Amazon Publishing that could, in their own right, become, you know, another big five publisher. Although a lot of these big publishing houses, which are owned by huge media companies, by the way. So, of uh, course. Even, yeah, Penguin Random House is owned by Sony, Bertelsmann, BMG. You wow, know, okay. I didn't so, know that. And Simon and Schuster, oh. I think that's CBS. Rupert Murdoch owns HarperCollins, mm -hmm. and so they Makes buy a, a they've bought a lot of media companies, and then under their publishing umbrellas, they have different imprints, which mm -hmm. used to be smaller publishing companies that they bought up. So, they became bigger publishing companies with more resources, and you know, probably just kind of feed it and grow it. Yeah, and you know, so some of it is just too big to sustain itself they they have they buy a lot of imprints they close then they fold them you know um it's better to have more variety in the marketplace but for a very long time it's always been yeah big fish eats the little one even in the the world of book retail i i was watching this movie uh with with my fiance uh just you know for like a date night we were watching uh 
Sleepless in Seattle with Meg Ryan. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's like a classic. Yeah, yeah. Of Tom and in the movie, she owns a little independent bookstore in New York City. And this guy played by Tom Hanks, you know, they, they meet online. They're anonymous. They don't know each other, but they also know each other in real life, but they don't know it. He's he's selling real estate to like a big chain bookstore, Barnes and Noble. And so in the movie, Barnes and Noble is kind of like the bad guy mm -hmm. because they're putting all the little independent bookstores, <laughs> you know, yeah. out of business. And I'm watching this. I'm thinking to myself, everyone in publishing loves places like Barnes and Noble now because they're contending with places like Amazon. They were contending with places like Costco, these big box yeah. stores that, you know, did wholesale and price slashing. And so, whereas in the past, we vilified places that, you know, were undoing the, the little mom and pa independent bookstore. Now, with in the face of Amazon, you know, we're praising <laughs> Barnes & Noble because, you know, we think of it like a traditional bookstore, although it is a, a chain. They're not the bad guy anymore. They, they've become the good guy. They've we become the, the, guy. the small independent ones under the rug. Yeah. And so if my point is, if anyone went, if a publisher went toe to toe with Penguin Random House, like let's say, you know, I mean, Amazon Publishing in its own right as book publishing imprints, they have editors who work there, they publish books beyond, I'm not just, I'm not talking about the self-publishing stuff. You know, if they com competed with a, like a Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, everyone would be like, oh, suddenly Amazon's the hero of this story. Whereas <laughs> in the past, everyone was vilifying them, right? Yeah. So it's interesting how the, that story, that narrative can change. We need a sequel to that movie, what we need, <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh yeah, today it would be Meg Ryan, you know, runs a, you know, Barnes and Noble that's, you know, oh, <laughs> going to go under, you know, and maybe Amazon is going to put it out of business or something like that or or a Costco or whatever. I feel like Amazon's like in the position where like almost any kind of business segment they invest in whether it be books or something else, it's just, it's just going to be so big with the amount of resources they could put into it. Oh, they have they have massive resources, but the thing is that a lot of it is sometimes in service of other things. So yeah, you know, they wanted a lot of people buying originally they wanted people buying the Kindle. It was yeah. less yeah, it was less about you know the ebooks and all that stuff. They wanted people buying devices. Mm -hmm. And then they realized people didn't want single use devices, they wanted tablets that could do multiple things. And, um, you know, so they've, they've kind of moved, moved away from certain spaces, you know, a lot of it was, again, in the service of other things. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to watch and, uh, you know, to see how it will all play out. Yeah, something I'm kind of curious about, you know, what's the inflation, at least where I'm at in, you know, in Seattle area, in the job market, it seems like people had been a lot more they they've been in a better position salary wise. Like it was been really common people saying, "Hey, you know, on top of a job shortage with the inflation going up, I want more money." And you know, if you're a higher employee, obviously you, they, you're usually getting that. I was wondering, you know, with the inflation going up and the publishing houses kind of needing more high selling manuscripts, have you been able to agent that or you know leverage that as an agent kind of for your clients? Well. Publishers are always going to be buying books. I mean, even in 2020, they were mm -hmm. buying books because they could picture a, de a day where the pandemic would be behind us, hopefully. And anytime they buy a book, they're thinking of publishing it, you know, one yeah. to two years out. Uh, so they always need to be buying books. And the good mm -hmm. thing about working at, you know, a literary agency or a talent agency is you're like kind of the on-ramp to the yeah. super highway of book publishing. Um, so they always need to come to you for for content mm -hmm. you know the thing that's difficult is as with their own employees you know they're trying to on the one hand pay their own employees less and then raise prices sure. at the same time they're going to be trying to pay less for books that yeah. they buy from authors and agents and both in terms of the advances and what they pay out in, in royalties so you have to kind of push back on publishers on this stuff you know, they're going to try and grab certain other rights, like the foreign rights to books. In the past, 
you know, you could actually, this is before I even worked in publishing and, and, and before eBooks, but in the past you could kind of break out the rights mm -hmm. to a book such that you could sell the hardcover rights to the book to one publisher, the paperback rights to another. Um, you know, cool. eventually publishers just expected to get all the, those print rights, but you were able to, when I began in publishing, you were able to sell the audiobook rights separately. So you could reserve the audiobook rights for the author, sell it to an independent audio publisher, and that would garner, you know, an additional advance and royalties for the author. It was a lot more economically sound to be able to hold on to your rights. Yeah. And the publishers kind of, I don't know, they just sort of kind of quietly colluded. They um, just sort of all one day suddenly agreed, no, nope, we need the audiobook rights. They to help make their numbers make sense because you know yeah. the economy at the time was bad and you know the government did, didn't intervene it was it wasn't i don't know what you would call it. it wasn't a market correction it was like it was almost as though someone picked up the phone called another publisher and said hey we're gonna just start reserving the the audio rights in every deal we do so then it was harder to hold on to audio rights for authors in most cases I bet they kind of do something like that. I mean, you have to imagine they do talk a bit. I think so. You know, there's, I mean, obviously if they do it in writing, that's one mm. thing, you know, they have an antitrust issue on their hands like they did in the Apple yeah. eBooks, e uh, you know, uh, it was like a pricing scandal having to do with, um, you know, uh, these CEOs of these publishing companies talking with Steve Jobs and calling each other and fixing prices against Amazon. That's definitely collusion. That's and, bad collusion. And yeah. for them to do it in writing on top of it, like they really have no common business sense and, you know, definitely not a, a background in law to be putting stuff like that in writing. So they, they did get a bad, you know, slap on the wrist publishers. But then when it came to audiobooks, it was almost as though, they got smart enough to just pick up the phone and call each yeah. other rather than do this in writing. Yeah, it's like let's let's just have no record of this. This is this will be great. Like, so it's true. <laughs> it's unfortunate for authors, you know, that publishers mm -hmm. insist now on having the audiobook rights just to help their numbers make sense. You know, yeah. Like, if you on, want man. your yeah, exactly. If you want like, your you numbers, really need that as well. Like, right. My my attitude is if you need to make your numbers better publish better do a better job yeah. publish books in a more meaningful way sell more books mm -hmm. you know it's it's very lazy work to to have to in, insist upon that kind of thing i was watching in, an interview with david baldassi you know the um the you know, the, the thriller author and mm -hmm. that's one thing he actually said that the best decision he ever made as an author was not giving away his foreign rights to the publishing house Oh, for sure. That's a that's yeah. a big part of it. That's a, so the reason why you don't want to give foreign rights away to a book publisher is if the publisher keeps the foreign rights, you know, what could happen is in the worst case scenario, the publisher maybe doesn't translate the book into a given language or mm -hmm. sell it in their language. And they're very, very reticent to return the unsold rights. Even if they did, it's hard to sell, you know. Yeah. They might not want the people to actually just be able to publish the book or another publishing house. Well, so that's the worst case scenario. Best case scenario, if the publisher has the foreign rights, is they either sell it to another publisher paying an additional advances and royalties, mm -hmm. or they publish it through one of their own arms. But whatever income that foreign edition of the book makes, it all gets applied against an unearned book advance that the author yeah. received from the publisher. So you already have a massive toll on the road there. And secondly, you know, some of these publishers take upwards of 50% or more on the uh, proceeds okay. on foreign rights. So that's wow. a huge, like your income is like, you know, sometimes more than cut in half. Uh, whereas if you retain your foreign rights and you work with a literary agency okay. to sell them to an outside publisher, that's a direct set of advances and royalties paid to the author. You know, there's no massive toll on the road. No an middle agency, person there. Yeah. And an agency's commission is very small compared to what a publisher takes, you know. Um, 
And then on top of all of that, a lot of foreign publishers buy books based on a license arrangement. It's like a driver's license. So every, whatever oh. it's 10, 15 years, you need to get a new photo and renew your mm. driver's license. It's the same with foreign publishers. They renew their licenses to publish a book. And they usually, in doing a renewal, they pay a, a new set of advances and royalties that are usually come up to wherever the market value is or how the book is performed. Or maybe they clear out the unearned advances, you know, things like that. Whereas when you sell your book in the U.S. to a U.S. publisher, and let's say the foreign rights are lumped in with that, mm. the U.S. publisher expects to acquire the book based on term of copyright which is different than a license. That means oh. they own your book for the term of copyright, which is life of the author mm -hmm. plus 78 years after the author's death. So, so you're never going to get any of that, that additional royalties or advances or any of that. You won't get it back. Well, you if the book is earning and doing really well, yeah. you might get some of the income on the back end. But what I'm saying is you won't get those rights back unless maybe the publishing contract gets canceled or the rights get bought back or the book goes out of print. But those are circumstances that you don't necessarily want to see occur. You want the book to no. be successful. But so that's why it's important to keep the foreign rights because it's an additional income source and it's not, it doesn't get the hit with this big toll on the road. So it was a similar thing with audiobooks for authors. In keeping your audiobook rights, you could benefit from it. Uh, the thing that worries me is when, you know, in seeing publishers wanting to go after the foreign rights now, you know, some of these publishers, they try when they don't know better, but they try to go after the book to film and TV rights. And oh. yeah, typically in our industry, authors tend to keep their film and TV mm -hmm. rights. Yeah. Um, and because frankly, you know, book publishing companies are publishers. They're not they, even though they might like to think of themselves as film and TV companies, they're not. They're not. And, you know, it's very hard to sell film and TV rights, uh, you know, but you got to treat it like I said, the way that the foreign rights are treated or the mm -hmm. audio rights were treated. Um, so we, we do help our clients in that space quite a bit. And it's not a really a good outcome when publishers have the film and TV rights, because oftentimes they don't know what to do with those rights they don't know how to properly exploit those rights and that's and, like the probably kind of the dream you know as an author like you want the big netflix or movie adaptation of your book of course but not a lot of authors you know go about it in the right way maybe someone's just like oh i just want to get published i don't care and they yeah. they go to a small publisher or they don't have an agent and the publisher says we're going to have your film and tv rights and the author doesn't think and they give the film and tv rights away you know or I've seen authors who've come to me from other agencies and some of these, you would think they'd be mm -hmm. smaller agencies, but some of them are sizable agencies. And these places have given away their film, the film and wow. TV rights for these authors to some major publishers. It's hard to believe, but a lot of publishers who work with us, they know that that kind of thing would never get through the door at Trident and that we really make a point of retaining the film and TV rights for the authors in order to really help them with it. I mean, that's um, such a huge revenue source, potentially. I mean, maybe it never happens, but at least you have a better shot. <laughs> well, the thing with regard to the film and TV rights is you could do an option for, for it. You can sell it, and then there's a purchase price and sometimes a production mm -hmm. credit for the author. So there could be some income there. But really where you see the income is it helps to sell books. You know, yeah. it gets people lined up at the bookstore uh, it's like a giant TV commercial for your book, basically. And they usually do like, you know, some kind of, let, let's say it's going to be made in this popular show or that Amazon or some Netflix is betting it's going to sell a bunch of copies. You know, they'll usually do like a reprint of the book with, you know, the new cover on it, what, don't they? Oh, with the movie poster. Yes. Sometimes yeah. They do that. You know, that you have to work that out with the film and TV company that you're able to get that as a part of the deal. But publishers might not put that level of thought in. You know, yeah. the other thing is like, it's, it's the same thing. The income thrown off from a film and TV adaptation would be applied against the authors under an advance and the publisher would take the lion's oh. share of the proceeds, you know? 
So that's another, just another reason why, you know, you don't want to do that. Um, and the work we do in that space is a lot more meaningful. Like I'll give you a good example. Uh, Penguin Random House at one point says, we're going to open, oh no, this is back when they were Random House. Random House said, we're going to open Random House Studios. We're going to make our own films. Mm -hmm. They made like one or two. They were both a flop, you know, and, <laughs> um, you know, it di didn't really go anywhere. Um, whereas this past year at the Oscars, we had like a few of our books adapted for film and TV. Uh, King Richard, based off of the memoir, one of our clients, Richard Williams. That's uh, awesome. House of Gucci, but based on the book by Sarah Gay Ford and, and mm -hmm. Dune, based on the book by Frank Herbert. Oh, yeah. Good old Dune. I grew up around here. Yeah. Um, that's right. He was a West Coaster. And then, uh, and then uh, Netflix's biggest budget film to date, The Gray Man, with Ryan Gosling, that we also put that together. It's based on the book by Mark wow. Green. So the work wow. we do in that space is a lot more you know, meaningful to authors because I don't know how many agencies or publishers can really make the claim that we had three books at the Oscars this past year. The how pretty many? big that, that's a pretty huge achievement, really. Yeah. I mean if you think about it, they're lucky if they have one there. Yeah. In the, maybe in the lifetime of the agency or, you know, something like that. So it just I mean, think of what like on like the gray man on Netflix. You're competing with all these titles to think that because I mean I watched it. It was an amazing movie. And that was like number one. Might even still be number one for, for a long time. Oh, and they're making a second one. And oh, yeah, man. it did help, you know, book sales for sure. You know, it was a big boost to that. And then it helps us make foreign sales to publishers, mm -hmm. things like that. So, you know, there are reasons why we do that kind of work as a service to our, our clients. But yeah, you know, my hope is that, you know, what's the expression when the the going gets tough, the tough get going type uh -huh. thing. You know, I would much rather see publishers kind of take that line of thought than to just kind of rest on their laurels and say, well, you know, the economy is tough, inflation, we don't really want to work much harder. Let's just now insist we get the foreign rights as a part of every book. We'll just, we'll just take well, that because why yeah. not? <laughs> or maybe if they make a land grab of the film and TV rights, similarly, that would be a disaster for authors, you mm. know? And when I saw this going on with audiobooks and what publishers did and that and how they, it was, I'm telling you, it was like, you could smell it in the air. It was like publishers had quietly colluded that, okay, we're getting the audio rights now as a part of every deal. Like who suddenly made that decision? Ah, like, oh, wow. you, you all suddenly came to the same conclusion at the same time, huh? Right, right. You know, I really wanted to see authors and agencies like the Authors Guild and, you know, big literary agencies push back against publishers. But people, I was so shocked and surprised. They really just kind of very willingly gave into it. Wow. But I do think agencies and authors would, it would really be a big fight if publishers went after foreign rights or film and TV rights in the same way that they did with, um, you know, the audiobook rights. That might be kind of what's down, what were they're looking at in the future? The next big kind of thing on their plate to scoop up like that. I don't know, but it's a sort of mentality of these like big companies. I mean, look yeah. at how they think, you know, it's like I was watching this TikTok video about some, this woman was giving business advice or something. She said, what's one of the worst things a company can say to you? And she said, the phrase is, we are a family. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a pretty bad one. They don't mean that. They really don't mean that. They're saying that to you. So yeah. like you buy that 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 line of advice or, 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 or you know, whatever. And then uh, you one the next thing you know, your your job's on the line or something, mm -hmm. or, you know, if, if Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster says, mm -hmm. oh, we're all a family. And then they merge and then they cut out all these departments uh, and personnel. That's not what families do. It's not a very good family to be in. Right. So, you know, I think it's really naive for people working in those companies to believe that this could be good for them as individuals. And if you're an author and you think this is a good thing, it it's even more naive. So, you know, I think 
people, they have been pushing back. Agencies don't like this. A lot of authors don't like this. Certainly the DOJ doesn't like it. Yeah. Um, I do think the cards are stacked against uh, Penguin Random House and Simon and Schuster. Glad the DOJ stepped in. Thankfully, and that was that, that. That's a pretty big move from them. Thankfully, I mean, we'll see what happens, but um, they can actually them doubling down. If I might actually kind of have to be a quite the courtroom brawl over it all, right? Um, so you know, if we do end up in a situation like that. You know, my hope would be that kind of other publishers begin to rise to the occasion. They become bigger publishers in their own right. You know, hopefully there's more variety in the marketplace or something to kind of force a change. Like a good example is, you know, Netflix came along as a big disruptor mm -hmm. initially. We used to have Blockbuster, then we had Netflix. Everything Back streaming was... Day. Yeah, <laughs> at one point, everything streaming was done through Netflix. Mm -hmm. And then it put huge pressure on the studio system and Netflix became a giant. And then what happened to Netflix was all these studios woke up, you know, Disney, Paramount, all these places said, well, as these licenses expire, we're going to pull them off of Netflix. We're going to make our own streaming services. And uh, suddenly there won't be a need for just to have everything on Netflix. And so now what Netflix is realizing, because their stock has gone down, there was a crash out there. Yeah, they laid off a bunch of people. Uh, they realize we need to not make more co content necessarily too much or have all these licenses we've lost, mm -hmm. but make our own quality content. Yeah. But that will always be the good thing. And being an author or working in an agency is you're, you're seated where the, the content is, and that's what the publishers need. Well, that's like what Amazon tried, and I they tried, they kind of succeeded, was Lord of the Rings, or not Lord of the Rings, uh, The Wheel of Time, a couple yes. months ago. They were trying to have that, I mean, obviously it's not an Amazon original, but they were trying to take that book series and make it a, a Game of Thrones competitor, and yeah, they're doing it again with the, the new Lord of the Rings show coming out in September. Um, yes. So, I mean, like, as a publisher, or, you know, an agent, like, it seems like a good time for adaptations or like they're wanting to buy some of these book series. There's quite a bit. Um, actually, Lord of the Rings was just bought by a big media group, the rights to it. But the interesting thing is that, you know, remember how term of copyright expires. It's mm -hmm. like the author plus 78 years. So they're only going to be able to milk that for so long, you know, eventually it's <laughs> just going to go into public domain. And then like Shakespeare, anyone can make a Shakespeare movie. Right. Yeah. So, you know, they're going to have to make the best of that while they can. So I think what they're going to do is very quickly in a short span of time, they're going to churn out a lot of Lord of the Rings related content, just mm. melt it as much as they can for as long as they can before it goes right into the public domain. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Did you, did you hear about the Brian Sanderson kind of thing that he did a couple months back? I think so. Uh, on Kickstarter, he, yeah. uh, you know, he put some content up there and then it kind of took off in a very, very big way. He's kind of got a, a legion, like an army behind him. Of, he does. <laughs> uh, like fans and followers of people who help him work with him. And um, he's a very nice guy, actually. I met him at a writer's conference in Provo, Utah. It's called LD Storymakers. Of all things, it, it's actually a Mormon writers conference, and they're some of the nicest mm. people I've ever met. Um, Brandon Sanderson himself is a Mormon author. Yeah. And uh, actually, a lot of great science fiction and fantasy writers are that people wouldn't necessarily know. So, for instance, um, the author of uh, uh, who uh, who wrote Twilight, uh, Stephanie really? Meyer, um, and the author of, um, oh gosh, what's the book? It's a sci-fi book where the kids, they fight in space. They made it into Ender's a, Game? Ender's Game. The author of that book, also yeah. an author. A lot of them went to BYU and came out of the writing program wow. there. But uh, I, I mention it because it's sort of like a lot of people like to buy uh, goods in New England, right? They love, mm -hmm. for instance, L.L. Bean, or they love like certain goods that have uh, these legacy brands made in New England because they feel like there's a very strong work ethic yeah. in New England and the, in terms of the quality of things made there. Uh, and I think 
there's a very strong work ethic among uh, Mormon authors. They're very hardworking and they're very closely knit with tightly knit within their church and they support one another. They help one another. Uh, they, they give back. It's not like, you know, you put a bunch of buckets in the uh, crabs in the bucket and they all try and escape. Yeah. Well, they, instead of helping each other out of the bucket, they see another crab trying to escape. They pull mm -hmm. the other crab down to try and climb up and escape. And then the crab behind it does the same thing. Whereas Mormon authors kind of would all pile together and find a way to help each yeah. other make out of the bucket. And I saw that just in going to that that writers conference and meeting a lot of Mormon authors. They see someone who's successful in their community, mm -hmm. which is a massive church, and they just want to help each other, which is a great thing. I'm actually in a really, I would say, highly dense Mormon area, but there's a pretty heavy Mormon influence here, mm -hmm. and that's really how it is. Like they support each other, businesses, and just they make an effort to actually support people of their same faith and religion opposed to, you know, kind of competing with them. But uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, Brandon Sanderson is already a big author in, in his own right. You know, he is right. He's a New York times bestselling author. Um, it's hard to say what was sort of the magic behind it. He might've gotten a lot of support from Kickstarter. Maybe they were very excited to see an author of his caliber on there. Um, but it's not, I don't think, Kickstarter is going to be a big disruptor for the no. industry. It was sort of like a a fluke. Yeah, the, the yeah. perfect storm. Yeah, I would be really, really surprised if suddenly authors were like, well, we're just going to start putting our content on <laughs> Kickstarter, getting support from it, and then you know doing books that way. Brandon Sanderson, for all we know, he could have just sort of tripped something in the uh, in the algorithms, you know? Well, him too. I mean, just his his following on social media and everything. It seemed, you know, most authors don't have that. Um, mm -hmm. and so I feel like he really capitalized on that. Yeah, that aspect. It was really just to to get everyone together, and, he, and his marketing for it was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just don't, but I don't think he he's might the do exception that. though. He's the exception to the rule. I don't think he. He might do that again, but I don't think that will be the I only doubt. thing he does. I think he's going to continue traditional publishing because there are yeah. many, many, many more benefits to it. But yeah, it's interesting to to see that space. I actually, I go on Kickstarter sometimes to find book projects, and I oh, found okay. a few that went on to get published there. So, you know, I, I peruse Kickstarter sometimes, mm -hmm. and, you know, there are similar websites I go on and looking for book projects like Tapas, Webtoons, things like that. So, but I, I think that, it's really good for that kind of stuff, like creators who are having a hard time getting published and maybe they want to do yeah. a short print run or get the attention of people in publishing. It's really meant for that. Yeah, not the, it's never going to be a mainstream thing. If it does, I'd be surprised. That'd be, that'd be very surprising. <laughs> If Kickstarter became the next big five publisher, you know, <laughs> and they want to go toe to toe with, Penguin, Random House, Simon. I would have seen it, yeah. Wait, wait, so I'm trying to think what would the acronym be? It would be P-R-H-S-S. -S. It kind of... It's a long acronym. Or it almost makes... It's it's like a... Kind of like a fart sound. Like... A <gasps> it, it, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue as Penguin Random House does. They got to think of a new name if they do that. It's way too much of a mouthful. We talked before about book burnings. Oh okay. yes, yes. I, I I'm curious. When I said that, I'm like, okay, what is going on there? Well, I mean, this has been going on since the dawn of time. Basically, every kind of book is going to upset someone. Of you course. know, almost no matter what you write, people could find a way to be offended uh, or bothered mm -hmm. by it in some way. So yeah, book burning has been going on for a while, but more recently, it, it's gotten attention because. You know, the rise in certain movements, you know, Black yeah. Lives Matter, Stop Asian Hate and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the interesting thing with these book burnings and then and some of these books getting banned in very conservative schools or yeah. schools and things like that is it they're sort of pouring gasoline. And, uh, uh, you know, they think they're pouring gasoline on the fire. But what it really does is it just gets the attention of the media. It's like there's no... Mm -hmm such thing as bad press for some of these books. So 
Uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, a school, I think, in Tennessee had taken issue with Art Spiegelman's Mouse, which... Oh, yeah. Uh, that book won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, that's, an amazing, that's like world-changing kind of book. That's an important book. I mean, <laughs> Art Spiegelman as a artist and a writer, he's he's not only in the pop culture lexicon, that book is required reading in most schools. Yeah. You know, he has had artwork everywhere, like in the New Yorker. I mean, granted his his wife, Francois Mouly, she's the art director of the New Yorker. So of course he's had opportunities oh, yeah. to wow. covers and cartoons for the New Yorker. But he also is a seminal figure in comic books. Like in an episode mm -hmm. of The Simpsons, they kind of show these kind of founding fathers of modern day graphic novels. It's basically... Mm -hmm you know, him, Alan Moore, and maybe Frank Miller. Uh, and mm -hmm. he had started a um, magazine called Raw, which is not around anymore now. They're kind of collector's items. But a lot of comic book artists who we know and read today, he had initially serialized or published in this, you know, wow. graphic novel or comic arts uh, magazine of his. And then he's given so much to comic books and the writing community in that he... Um, he runs MOCA, the Museum of Comic Creators and Artists. Wow. It's like a festival. He's done a lot. Um, so anyway, I don't know what it was, but some school in Tennessee took issue with, I think, the way that a suicide was depicted in the book. Mm. Um, granted, it's a cartoon. Uh, I've read it. You know, I think most of the things are pretty mild in the book. Yeah. People thought it was sort of a, uh, you know, an ulterior there was an ulterior motive to basically ban a, a jewish book it, by, that seems like the only real i mean it's been around for so long it's been around for so long and it's just like an accepted it's, thing now yeah. this is like it's part of the literary canon basically it's a modern classic really it, it and is completely so there was a big uproar over this and the school banning and burning this book or whatever all it did was it boosted books. Oh, yeah. It went mm. right. This is an old book that was published a long time ago. It went right back onto the New York Times yeah. list. It was a massive bestseller. People were buying <laughs> the book in protest. So the irony, of course, is it has the opposite effect when you try to burn books or ban books, whatever. And it's no different than, you know, however you feel about politics. Mm -hmm. If people really want to do away with Trump or they don't like Trump, the thing is not to, you got to take oxygen away from a fire. Yeah. You know, you want to diffuse a, a bomb. You don't, you know, continually light the fuse. No. <laughs> just cut the fuse off and stop giving it any attention. And then the bomb diffuses. People don't seem to be able to stop doing that or be able to let go of Trump. If they could let go mm -hmm. of Trump, he would stop sucking up all the oxygen yeah. in the room. And it's sort of the same thing with banning books and burning books. You're just going to, it's going to have the opposite effect. So now if you really want to, if that school really wanted to just not give any attention to Art Spiegelman and Mouse, they would have just kind of been very quiet about this and not Quietly made a big take it off the shelves. Yeah. yeah. Instead, um, they made a big deal about it. And it just ended up helping the book and the author in the end. I remember whenever that first started happening and like, when you go to like any bookstore and they had a banned book section, that was like the front one and like just book tubers and all these random people were suddenly doing reviews yeah. of, uh, of that book. So it just, it's popularity just skyrocketed. Yeah. Cause people felt like they could be a punk rocker by buying mm. this book. Yeah. And you know, you see this thing play out over and over again. People were burning uh, Margaret Atwood's book, um, the yeah. handmade stuff. And it became a popular book in the midst of, <laughs> what's going on with Roe versus Wade and abortion mm -hmm. rights and all that. And Margaret Atwood went out and made a version of her book, which is Flame. Yeah, yeah, Flame. A photo of her, a video uh, basically trying to torch the book and it won't burn. Uh, so you're, again, awesome. try as you might, but you're just going to give more attention to this stuff. Mm -hmm. So the way, it's kind of like with internet trolls. If you feed them, they just grow bigger. But if you ignore them, they just kind of, go off into the trash bin of, of history. And and now we're seeing this again today with, I tweeted about it, what's his name? Uh, Salman Rushdie, who mm. wrote the Satanic Verses. Yeah. You know, he was recently attacked 
uh, at a reading. He was, I think he was stabbed and, and oh, and that too. The guy tried to beat him and he's recovering in the hospital, thankfully, and all that. that. But then his book has now soared to the bestsellers yeah. list again, years and years after publication, you know? And so I said, it's like a, a phoenix, you know? Mm. The more you try and like kill or destroy or burn that, that bird, it will just rise from the ashes again, but much stronger than before, right? Yeah, you're going to get a lot more copies with that. Right. So that that's what I think people don't really understand, you know, regardless of how you feel about Salman Rushdie or his book mm -hmm. messages. Some people would even venture to say, like, it's a terrible thing to say, but like he was he's he had been kind of he had been courting trouble for a long time in mm -hmm. not just having written that book by but by making very public appearances. You know, one year I was at I think it was the London Book Fair. And he made an appearance there and there was a, a protest and then there was a bomb scare, you know, when his book initially published and that there's fatwa and all this, that people were declared and people were so afraid. If you worked at Penguin Books at the time, not only did they install metal detectors of the offices as you came in, mm. but they confiscated pe uh, people's uh, canvas bags that they would carry mm. if they had a Penguin logo on it. So um, I feel bad for what happened to him, but at the same time, it's like he he set things in motion in this way and then also um, would make very public appearances. Uh, I actually met him once, I, ironically enough. I was walking in New York City. This is kind of funny in a way. Um, I feel very bad for what happened to him, but it's funny in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do uh, fencing, and so I would oh, that's carry... Awesome over my shoulder, uh, like slung over my shoulder, swords in a bag. Mm. And one day I was turning a, a corner in a New York City street and kind of like a wide truck taking a turn. I didn't see someone behind me and I almost hit them in the head with this. And this guy ducked as the, <laughs> the bag of swords went over his head. And he said, will you watch where you're going with that? And I said, I'm sorry. And I looked at him and I, I was like, wow, it's Salman <laughs> Rushdie. I almost fulfill the plot while on his head without even meaning to um so yeah i feel bad for what happened to him but it, he kind of has had this way of like courting mm. trouble or bad luck is what i want to say because at one point in his life he did go into hiding but then he started making very public appearances yeah. and i think in doing that given the nature of everything in the state of the world the way it is today you you can't go anywhere without a security yeah. detail. You know, he 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 needs a full time bodyguard, basically. It's um, crazy to be like to have, have that many people mad at you about something. I mean, well, it is a complicated issue, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, the nature of the book is that, like, you know, I think it's the Prophet Muhammad or something like that. Supposedly, this voice or whoever came to him, it was really an evil or satanic thing yeah and, you know pe some people are very fervent about their religion mm -hmm. and um you know it offended a lot of people and um whoever declared a fatwa on um Salman Rushdie's yeah. head, it basically means if you fulfill that it's like your ticket to heaven yeah exactly and so there are a lot of people who are like well who wouldn't want to then fulfill that um if they're very like fervently religious mm -hmm. And um, part of the issue, too, of course, is to talk about the nature of religion. I mean, it just goes beyond offending people. But, um, you know, any kind of religion taken to the extreme is never good, right? Yeah. Because religion can exist in, in many different places, but mainly it res exists either in, in the head, in the brain, mm -hmm. or, or the heart. I think it's really meant to exist in the heart. And yeah. when it gets too much into your head, um, that's when you go off the deep, deep end. end. Yeah, exactly. And so, you see that across the board whenever it gets too ideological like that. That's when it really starts to go downhill. Oh, for sure. And, um, you know, some people end up getting caught in the wake of all that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but the good thing is he's making a recovery and, um, you know, it's great to see that, you know, people try as they might in burning books. It's it's just they're they're making phoenixes is what I like to say. And um, I like that. 
yeah, you'll never really be able to to do away with stuff like that. I think you and I talked in another mm -hmm. recording or something about how every year um, someone publishes Mein Kampf by yeah. Adolf Hitler. Yep. And a lot of people say like, oh, that's a terrible book. It's this evil person's hateful mm -hmm. message. Uh, shouldn't be out there in the world. Uh, of course, it's freedom of speech and you have to really protect freedom of speech as much as you can. Sometimes up to a certain point, it's hard to say where it incites violence. Um, but, um, you know, it's it's a book that's always going to be out there pretty much because it exists. And but the more you try and like burn that book or snuff it out, it's just going to yeah. proliferate that book for a different group of people or someone else. I kind of mean, if you go talk to 100 people, I bet you'll get 100 people who have not read that book. Oh, of course. But but um, if you ban it and then give it all this attention. Yes. Suddenly people are like, well, maybe I should pick up the book. And that's kind of the opposite of what you're wanting. Yes. And, you know, that book is obviously important for other reasons. It's mm. a historical text. It's a way to understand, contextualize history. I don't think people should be reading that book for just the sake of inspiring, you know, them yeah, as no, Nazis. That's... <laughs> like, I think they should be reading that book to understand, oh, that's who this person was mm -hmm. in history, this terrible stuff that happened, how we don't repeat that stuff. And it's merely a historical text. Yeah, this is how this terrible thing actually came about. Right. But again, most people again probably don't even really know how it came like the second world war and all that stuff happened right but being able to actually go this is the person responsible for that and this is his ideologies yes and it has its it has its own lessons so that we don't repeat them in history mm -hmm. and um so you know that's really the thing people should should take wisdom from books and make the world better yeah. not try to burn or destroy them well like they did the same thing with how to kill a mockingbird oh, which yeah. is so ironic <laughs> at one point they took issue with that too that's right yeah it's like they were calling it racist but it's like no the entire point of the book is to not be racist well that's sort of like when a sword tries to cut righteously but it really doesn't like certain things just go too far mm -hmm. you know there's social justice but like sometimes it's not always in the service of social justice. No, it's like you're going in the wrong direction. Like I know you guys are trying to make this better, but you're going in the wrong direction here. Yeah. I just reverse yeah. the wheel a little bit. Yeah, it's widely accepted as a classic. It really did make the world a better place yeah. in a lot of ways. And you have to understand books for what they are, when they were written. Maybe it was a different time. You know, I'm starting to hear from some publishers now who want to put disclaimers in books. Yeah. Like, you know, kind of how you see in movies, like, viewer discretion is advised. Mm -hmm. um, the trigger warnings. Right. And it's like, you know, I don't know. You're kind of putting yourself at odds with the book you're publishing and mm -hmm. the author behind it. And at the same time, you're not exactly helping people think for themselves. And I think it's important for people to like, you know, see, hey, this was, this is how people actually were years ago. Yeah. Like, you know, Huckleberry Finn, I think they used the N-word in that. Right. Um, They tried pulling it out, but it's like, right. it's kind of important to know that that was common you, vernacular back there. It's important to know this stuff because if we forget, yeah. then we repeat this stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got to look in the mirror of history, learn its lessons, and then not repeat the mistakes yeah. i think if you whitewash history you're gonna have you're gonna have big problems because i mean yeah. there's a lot of terrible things throughout history and a mm -hmm. lot of terrible things that have been repeated it's mm -hmm. like it seems like with all of our technology and everything if anything we should be better at recording and learning from history not exactly. like trying to erase it right. um but so you know, the other side of the coin too is mm -hmm. People forget there's not just two sides to a coin. There's actually three. There's a very thin side that people don't see. And the thin side of all this is burning books is also a form of freedom of speech. It's yeah. a form of expression. You're making a statement by mm -hmm. burning a book. And I mean, it's not illegal or anything. It's not illegal. And I mean, as terrible of a thing as I may think it is, because... 
Mm -hmm. you know, I help authors get their books published and what yeah. have you. Although if someone wants to to burn a book and then it sells thousands more books because uh -huh. of it, like that, I, I might be for that. Uh -huh. But my point is, it's a form of freedom of speech. It's a it's a demonstration. Someone is is saying something, making a statement, and we live in a free country and we protect freedom mm -hmm. of speech. And so, people's right their right to burn a book, ironically, is actually something yeah. people need to protect. Yeah, it's like I disagree with what you're doing, but I don't think you should be forcibly stopped or anything. It's like we can we can disagree without crossing <laughs> crossing that line. Yes. You like, remember whenever they were burning the Nike shoes? Yes. Or so, I don't even remember what it, what, why they were doing it. Well, they were, yeah, the originally when Phil Knight had made those, the runner who wore them tore off the logos. That's didn't right. Didn't the logos on the shoe. Um, there's probably more to the story, but, and then the, the thing is, it's the same with the Air Jordans. Mm. They were banned early on, I think in the NBA or something like that. And then it just kind of, made them even more popular because when wearing yeah. those shoes you were like you know making a statement so yeah, you were protesting right right so the it's sort of like if you really really didn't want to give any attention to something you just wouldn't but just ban it <laughs> just, well or yeah but then people just can't help themselves so mm. But no, freedom of speech and protecting it is really important. Like, for instance, people say, why is the KKK allowed to march on Washington every year if they want? Well, a lot of people would say that's a form of freedom of speech, but it also incites violence. But then the irony is the people who like protected that group and its right to do that, I believe, initially was the ACLU, which yeah. are a group which are usually in opposition to groups like that. But they mm -hmm. realize the importance of freedom of speech of course there are places where you draw the line no you have to be able to have that because i feel like that is one of the things where it's like is if you start just banning things especially free speech where do you draw that line like it's easy to go one step too far and just keep that going yeah it's a very it's a gray area for sure yeah all i was gonna say is i remember when they were burning the nikes their sales went up like crazy because people were buying the shoes and then burning them Mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. like keep going guys yeah you protest this like crazy <laughs> oh anything that you burn i mean think of uh i remember seeing this album cover by rage against the machine there's yeah, a man yeah. who's sitting and he's on fire and i looked it up and it was a uh, these monks during the vietnam war in protest they would mm -hmm. they would sit on the steps of the Capitol and then they would self-immolate you know they'd light themselves on fire yeah. and they got it got a ton of media attention it became an iconic image a symbol of protest um and so you burn people burning books you're making it's like that monk you're making them mm -hmm. into this burning effigy that will forever like stick in people's minds like you think of like the imagery of like the kkk or whatever yeah you picture like a burning cross on the front lawn right iconic it's, it's iconic and like you burning a book you're going to be making a burning effigy mm. of that book but you know like guy i've seen like you know tiktok videos like it seems like whenever somebody does like a burning of something like even and i think it is illegal to like burn the american flag for example i think there mm -hmm. actually are laws that say you can't do that but poor people do it anyways of course but, yeah. and they don't get in trouble but like the video it always blows up yes it's like that's such a powerful statement burning something mm -hmm. yeah there are people on both sides of things and yeah no that's an, always been an interesting thing uh, but it's never really quite enforced right no one no one forces this stuff yeah i don't think anyone's because it's like what are you actually gonna do right throw someone in prison for it <laughs> right right it's almost like when people were taking the knee in the nfl and yeah. all that you know so it's state it's a statement it's a freedom of speech you know people might feel it's like oh you're disrespecting our country or our pride um but no it's a statement of freedom like um that woman uh, uh Seisheen, uh little feather i think her name is she um mm -hmm. marlon brando during what was supposed to be his acceptance speech for best actor at the academy awards for the godfather 
she got up, she read a speech about the mistreatment of Native mm. Americans. And she was like, she was booed off stage and people like, she was told the police were waiting for her. Like someone had to restrain John Wayne probably because he was <laughs> a method actor and still stuck in a role. You know, like wherever you sit on the side of her argument and what she said, it's a freedom of speech. And you know. Yeah, that really is, I mean, just something that kind of makes our country special. It seems like unique. Where it's like you can say stuff like that and probably won't get any repercussion. But like against the government, like whenever Trump was president, you know, well, people saying a lot of stuff, you're not really – you're not going to get in trouble for that. Mm. Whereas in other countries, you might. probably you might not want to be posting that on the internet. <laughs> right. So, mm. yeah, no, it's interesting to see. Mm. You know, my, my kind of final question, I have to get heading out sadly to work in a few minutes. Um. Do you think it's important for authors to kind of have a message like that? You know, whether it be some, I don't know if I'd say form of protest, but like have an issue attached to their platform. Well, it's I a think kind of double edged sword. Yeah. I think every story, regardless, on some level, whether it be mm -hmm. very in your face, like a Margaret Atwood or Salman Rushdie or an Art Spiegelman, or very subdued, like it could be you know, a beach read, women's fiction, romance novel, right? Yeah. Every story has a message. Every, mm -hmm. there's a moral to every story or by the end of the book, there's some, something's happened from some kind of either conflict's been resolved or there's been some kind of character growth. And so there's a message to every story. Otherwise, what's the point in telling the story? Yeah. So, and I think every author wants to sort of play up the message or the moral of the story or the central conflict of the story of course that's the thing to do will the you know debbie baycomber beach read upset a lot of people <laughs> probably not but will the nature of the message of something else yes and then will that go on to help sell books it could <laughs> but i would hate to see authors like i don't know using that as a gimmick to sell books yeah. rather they really feel that in their heart and want mm -hmm. to convey that to readers something you're passionate about or something yeah. to, okay what is the most like infuriating message i can put in here that will get a reaction from yeah people? that would be like uh saying to your publisher on the side of my book can you uh print a little uh match strip and then <laughs> attach a little box of matches uh that will get uh attention for readers and they then... did that with um Oh, What's they did the, the Ray Bla the the Ray Bra Bradbury one. Oh, really? They did that. Oh, that's pretty. Cool. Even had a lighter thing, so you could literally burn the book that's with like, the matches. That's like I I saw this uh, today on Reddit. I saw it like this Dead Kennedys tape, and it said like the record industry is struggling from people like you know rec stealing recording music on the other sides of tapes. So we left this side blank, so you can do that. <laughs> That's they want to awesome. become, kind of, yeah, punk rock about it, or it's like an album that says, like, steal this album, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, um, yeah, I've seen, like, yeah, musicians will do, they'll drop a song just for free or something. It'll be like, you know what? Screw the industry. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's, it's all in the service of other things, right? Oh, yeah. They're not losing money by doing this. Yeah, it could be could be a publicity stunt, you know. Mm -hmm. Brandon Sanderson, whenever he did his big, you know, um, Kickstarter thing, he actually he had put out like a video and it was like all that. He's like, "Hey guys, I gotta confess something to you all," and he it was just super dramatic thing. And people and then he left for like two weeks or a week or so, and everyone's like, "Oh crap, is he quitting?" <laughs> <laughs> or like, and he had like this whole mental health thing and it, giant publicity stunt but like that's genius yeah i mean it's the the oddest things will will sometimes mm. sell books even just seeing a book in the hands of a celebrity sometimes yeah will do the, the trick you know emma watson from harry potter I, i've seen a lot of them we'll, then we'll catch a picture of her reading something and that book sales will skyrocket <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's a very odd thing uh. Well, this is good. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you this. so much for joining us again. Um, Yeah, it's great speaking with you. I'm like trying to remember. I guess it's been about a year since we did the last one. Really? Wow. Time flies. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm looking like, dang, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, no, that seemed like yesterday, really. I know. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess that was, yeah, last summer. It's, well, you know, in pandemic, once one year to the next. <laughs> it did. It did. 
for sure. Yeah. Warp everyone's perception of time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. All right, Alex. Thank you again. Take good care and be well. Thank you.